Chapter 10 of The Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts No general coming home victorious from the wars, no king returning to his kingdom after a long absence, ever was more royally received than Father Vianney at ours. The parish, at five in the afternoon, lay under a pall of sorrow and loss. A few minutes after five, the church bells pealed out, the agreed signal if the beloved priest should return. He is coming! The curie is coming! Men threshing wheat left the threshing floor and ran down the road in the hope that they might be the first to see him. Boys helping their fathers in the fields were told to unhitch the horse from the plow and ride to the neighbors with the good news. Women left their baking and cooking, and children ran from their games to pull the curie's cassock and kiss his hands as he passed. They did not notice, as their elders did, that it was with great difficulty that he dragged himself along. In spite of the pang they felt at the sight of his weakness, the people could not help crowding around him, touching his clothing, assuring themselves that their saint, whom they had feared lost to them, was really back. Some of the men cleared a path for him, so that the exuberant people would not sweep him off his feet. "'It was the Blossom Mother who told me to come back,' he whispered to Father Raymond. "'I thank her, for now there is joy in my heart, and I am at peace.' For ten years more the Curie of ours continued his work, fighting to win souls for Christ, to help those who were already good to be better. At night the attacks of the furious adversary continued, sometimes subsiding for a day or a week, only to be renewed with redoubled violence. Several times during one night he might be thrown against wall or floor, but always he would arise, shaken but fighting old Scratch with the powerful weapon of prayer. France had been torn by a dull conflict, with foreign countries and within her own boundaries. Monarchy had been restored for a short time, with Louis Philippe on the throne. But again in February, 1848, the country endured a revolution. The king abdicted, and Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, nephew of the emperor, was elected president of France. There was revolt in Sicily, in Austria, in Poland. In fact, in all Europe there was not a single country which could claim internal peace. Many people believe that this was the beginning of the abomination of desolation spoken of in Scripture, with nation warring against nation and brother against brother. A thousand people a day were leaving Europe to seek shelter in the United States, but the states themselves were shaken by dissension on the question of slavery, a problem and quarrel which daily grew more threatening. These world upheavals, however, were unknown to or unnoted by the Curie of ours. His difficulties were more immediate. The fight for souls who came to him for help, the fight against the once more growing desire to enter a monastery. In 1853 he made his last attempt, and he defeated himself. Wise with inspired wisdom when counseling others, he was so guileless that he was unable to make or keep secret any plans which concerned him. To Catherine Lozane, he was in charge of Providence. He told his scheme, and discussed the running of the orphanage when he should be gone. "'I will walk to Lyons,' he said. "'I have a brother-in-law there, and I know he will lend me a carriage in which I can ride to the monastery of La Nelière, and there I will spend the rest of my days.' If it occurred to Catherine that it would be wiser and more expeditious to drive directly from ours, she did not say so. But she did tell her assistant, Marie Filiat, that the man they thought of as their saint was leaving them. The assistant told some of her neighbors. They told some of the pilgrims. Someone told the assistant pastor. The curie set out at midnight on his third effort to reach the life he yearned for, the life in which he felt he could serve God much better than he believed he was doing in ours. He was now almost sixty years old. His step was even slower than it had been when he last fled. But there was just as much hope in his heart just as much iron in the will which kept him pushing along. The houses along the deserted village streets were all closed. His rosary was his only companion. Walking was painful, now. The nights, which in earlier times he had spent sleeping on the cold, damp floor, had given him rheumatism, which tortured him as he plodded along. But his goal, a place of silence and contemplation, seemed so beautiful that the pains of his body were forgotten in the delight of his soul. He plodded on toward the small stream which marked the edge of the town. Twice when he had been told to leave ours, it was this little stream, flooding over the footbridge, which prevented his departure. He neared that footbridge now. Again it was covered, but not with water. His assistant was there, and the mayor of ours. 
people from the village were there, and a few pilgrims. He stopped, aghast. You cannot stop me, he cried in a wavering voice. You cannot prevent me from going. I will, because I must. As he spoke, the church bell of ours rang an alarm. Pilgrims, wondering what the trouble was, rushed out of the houses where they slept, and began converging on the place where they saw the glow of lanterns and heard the sound of many voices. When they learned what was going on, they set up a loud cry. You can't leave us. We need you. We have traveled miles and miles to get your fatherly counsel. You can't leave us orphans. There were tears from men and women alike. There was sorrow and there was fright. How would they gain heaven, the people thought, if they lost the man on whom they depended to guide them? Bowed with the heavy weight of his strenuous years, Father Vianney stood among them, pitifully thin and worn. His hours in the confessional had carved deep lines of grief into his face, though they had left his mouth firmly tender. Light from the lantern carried by the mare made a halo of his hair, while his brooding eyes seemed to disappear in the shadow of their sockets. A silence fell on the group. No bird stirred in the treetops. No animal moved in the underbrush to show fear at this midnight invasion. Even the little stream passed over the rocks without a murmur. Nature, as well as man, seemed hushed and waiting. An expression of physical pain twisted the curie's face, and he groaned as if he had been shown a cross beyond his strength to carry. He looked around him. There was the girl whose reputation had been bad when he came to ours. Now she was a fine Catholic wife and mother. Over there was one of the men who had always worked on Sunday in the past. Now neither he nor his family ever missed Mass on Sunday, and rarely on weekdays. Among the pilgrims was a couple who, his heaven-prompted intuition told him, were gravely in need of warning and advice. Father Vianney looked across the stream toward the path on the other side, the path which led to solitude. The knuckles of his twisted hand whitened as the rheumatic fingers tightened on his staff. His lips moved in prayer. Then slowly and sadly he turned, saying no word, and walked back to ours, followed by equally silent men and women. When they reached the church, the curie went into the sacristy and put on his stool. Then he seated himself in the confessional. His dream of solitude and quiet contemplation was over. Not long after Father Vianney had made his last act of renunciation, had resigned himself to living and dying in ours, the bishop arrived for a visit. By now the curie was involved in many things. Providence, a school for boys, work for the propagation of the Faith Society, which Pauline Jericho had founded, and numerous other projects. He was always in need of money, and it crossed his mind to wonder if the bishop had come to inspect his books. The curie started to make a speech of welcome. Smiling, the bishop waved him to silence. I have something for you, Father Vianney, he said. He held out a mozetta a short cape with a hood, which is worn by certain church officials. This one was decorated with a band of purple silk and two bands of ermine, the insignia of a canon, one of the special dignitaries of the church. Father Vianney was appalled. Oh, no, no, please, give it to my assistant. It will look much better on him. A little crowd had gathered on the arrival of the bishop, and they were all amused at the shock in the curie's voice. It is for you the bishop said firmly, putting the cape around Father Vianney's shoulders and buttoning the top button. That accomplished, he entered the church intoning the Veni Creator. Behind him walked the vicar general, quite accustomed to ceremonial. Father Raymond was next, happy in the honor which had come to the curie. A little procession of villagers and pilgrims brought up in the rear. And beside the bishop moved Father Vianney, looking for all the world like a man being led to his execution. Honors, he felt, would only add to his burden. Somehow he managed to get through the ceremonies. Somehow he acted as host to his distinguished guests at the little party which neighbor women hastily prepared. Somehow he stammered thanks for the honor and saw his guests apart. Then he hastily removed the cape, folded it, and put it away before he took up his duties again. The drain on his finances had grown as he reached out constantly in new directions. He sold the books in his library, his extra cassocks, his towels and handkerchiefs. His orphanage and the boys' school were fairly well established now, but there was the whole world needing missionaries, and he wanted to help in sending them forth. He also wanted to bring more mission preachers here into ours. One morning he had an idea which delighted him. He carefully studied the beautiful cape the bishop had given him. I shouldn't wonder if I could make quite a bit of money for my missions with that, he thought happily. 
With the silken ermine over the dusty arm of his worn old cassock, he trotted off to the home of Marie Richetier, an unmarried woman of some means. She had always been generous to the church, and had brought as souvenirs of the saint a good many of the things he had sold. "'Would you like to buy this cape?' asked Father Vianney as he entered the house. "'That Mosetta? Surely you aren't going to sell that. The bishop himself gave it to you. I think you will be hurt.' "'Not at all,' the curie interrupted. He made the gift to give me pleasure, and I will take that pleasure in the form of cash for my missions. Mr. Cotier was confused. If the curie was determined to sell the cape, she would like to have it. On the other hand, should she not try to dissuade him from taking a step which seemed to her ill-advised? Don't you think you should keep the cape, Father Vianney, if we have distinguished visitors? But the one in the tabernacle, surely, is the most distinguished. Who could ever come that we might compare with him? and he has seen me, and helped me, for years in my old cassock, with no fur and satin on top. Come, do you want to buy it? Miss Ricketeer still hesitated. Do you know what it is worth? I have no idea what to offer. I have no idea what it costs, protested the bishop. Suppose we'd say fifteen francs. It's worth more than that, I'm sure. Suppose we say twenty francs, then, beamed the curie, happy at doing so well for his beloved charities. I'll give you twenty-five francs, decided Miss Ricketeer, although I am not at all sure that is enough. Yes, I'm certain that is a fair price, said the curie, rising, and now I'll write to the bishop and tell him about my luck. I'll have enough now to bring some mission priests to ours. They can preach and do the good that I, in my stupidity, must leave undone. With joy in his heart, Father Vianney sat down to compose the letter to his bishop. Your lordship, he wrote, the cape which you had the charity to give me has afforded me great pleasure. Since I had not quite all the money I needed to bring a mission to the parish, I sold the cape for twenty-five francs. He had, however, to rewrite the letter before sending it. Miss Ricketeer, troubled by doubt as to whether she had paid enough for the cape, went to the convent of the nuns who had made it. They told her it had cost fifty francs, so she hurried to the curie and gave him another twenty-five. Father Vianney, therefore, changed the letter to read, I sold the cape for fifty francs. I am pleased with this price. It never even occurred to him to wonder if the bishop was pleased, too. When two years later he was appointed a member of the Legion of Honor of France, his reaction was much the same. In 1852, France, once again shifting her form of government, had become an empire, and President Napoleon was proclaimed Emperor of the French. The following year was an uneasy one, marked by plots against the emperor, attempts on his life, and a general seething disquiet among the people. But in 1854, France settled not only her own internal affairs, but most of her difficulties with other nations. Planning began for a big industrial expedition to open in Paris in 1855 on the emperor's birthday. Several people of importance had written to the minister of state to suggest that France would honor herself by honoring the curie of ours. The writers pointed out the sanctity of the humble priest, the work he had done for humanity, calling him a second St. Vincent de Paul. On August 11th, therefore, the Medal of the Legion of Honor was awarded him. As was usual in such cases, the bishop was formally notified first. "'You will take the Legion Medal to him?' the vicar general asked the bishop. "'No, I think not. He doesn't much value what I bring him,' replied the bishop with a smile. "'Someone close to him should bring it,' the vicar general mused. How about his new assistant? Since the men see each other daily, the curie would not be so likely to dispose of the medal. Good. We will notify, Father Tokenir, that the pastor to whom he has been assigned is to receive the medal of a legion of honor from his hands. The young priest was excited by the honor which had come to his curie, and pleased that he had been chosen to make the presentation. He spent several hours composing and memorizing a graceful little speech for the occasion. At noon, the priest, several of the brothers who taught in the boys' school, the two women who had helped establish Providence, and a few other old friends went to Father Vianney's house. They knocked, entered, and stood beaming, waiting for the presentation. But the young priest, in the excitement of the moment, completely forgot the words he had prepared. Here, he said, shoving out the precious red-sealed packet, they've sent you something, maybe some relics, or... Father Vianney took the package quickly and opened it. His face fell. It's only this, he said, holding up Francis' most coveted award. The Medal of the Legion of Honor. 
Catherine Lazzane exclaimed, sensing that the curate did not quite understand what it was he held. Put it on, suggested one of the brothers. Why, asked the curate, what is it? At least bless it, said another brother. The curate agreed to that. Do wear it, Father Vianney, urged Catherine Lazzane. The people will be so pleased to see it. I have worked among them for many years with no decoration pinned on me, the curate protested. He turned to Father Tocanier. You may have this, he said. Show it to anyone who wants to look at it. It's yours to do with as you like. I have no use for it. And he went upstairs to read his office. With the growing fame of ours as a place of pilgrimage, its curie had been forced to change many of his habits. As a boy in Eccoli, he had given himself a lifelong penance of never eating anything he liked. As a pastor, he had formed the custom of boiling a pot of potatoes once a week, and eating a few of them cold each day for his single meal, scraping off the mold as the end of the week neared. But as his hours in the confessional grew even longer, he couldn't even take the time to boil the potatoes. So he asked the women at Providence to prepare a small bowl of soup for him each day. He had, too, to listen to praise and compliments which disturbed him. Once, when a distinguished visitor pointed out that he, the curie of ours, was the first and only honorary canon appointed by the bishop, Father Vianney snorted. I don't wonder, he said sharply. He was unlucky in his first choice, and seeing what a mistake he had made, he didn't want to risk doing it again. End of chapter 10 Recording by Maria Therese